Hannes, uh, thanks for being here. Oh, thank you. And thank for you, me. thank you for inviting me to HealMe.myc. This is a really yeah. cool space. Oh, nice. I'm excited to chat with you. Oh, nice. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, like I said, I was just talking to you before. I found you on LinkedIn and um, your profile talking about um, deep breathing, deep learning. Um, you're doing a lot of interesting stuff around AI and VR, and also teaching mindfulness. Um, I want to talk about your current startup and, and what you're doing, but I think it probably makes sense to work our way back and, and kind mm -hmm. of go towards that mm -hmm. because not everyone finds themselves, um, you know, creating a, an AI app based on um, allowing people to look at screens and and thinking about things in this in this way. So. I guess just to kind of kick things off, um, how did you become interested in meditation and mindfulness? Um, it's like uh, just like trying to be happier. <laughs> 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 I mean, like people are listening. I feel like it's always like such a beautiful thing to whether we talk about the past or what's going on now, just rooting ourselves in the now, even with the listeners and just by deep breathing. If you do you mind if we do it together? Sure, let's do it's it. It's like just like um, so I, I like to my focus a lot is on belly breathing. Okay. So like always like expanding the belly on the inhale and trying to uh, go in there because mm -hmm. oftentimes I feel we're breathing so shallow in our daily life, especially in New York, we're breathing to our chest like so right. heavy. So just bringing just like for a few moments just to awareness fully on breathing and then trying to like breathe into the belly. I oftentimes say like it's a six pack free zone when we do breathing, right. <laughs> which is like letting go of any tension and just taking a few deep inhales and just a letting go exhale, a deep inhale. Letting go, exhale, full inhaling, adding a smile always creates happy hormones. Letting go, exhale, maybe two more inhaling. And letting go, exhale, one more, maybe the deepest inhale of this year, of today. And then letting go, exhale, nice, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, basically what led me to this was, um, maybe it's related to my birth trauma, so I had like a birth trauma where the umbilical cord was struck around my neck. Okay. So I wasn't, um, so that led, I think my parents estimated or assumed that led to like a lot of like anxiety and depression throughout my life. So it was only until my thir early 30s, around 30 or so that I discovered I needed to let like, everybody do something about it. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Like, and then so so that's how I discovered and yoga and meditation and, you know, a lot of Western medicine hasn't, didn't really help. Mm. much and so i discovered like oh what well, you know this this deals with what i already have the body but it like uh, it transforms it in a very powerful way so i tried out all kinds of practices and then i realized like oh the technology we've developed has not been very like integrate uh, integrating our like um, body sure. and our like self-healing practices so so that's a very short story of like what led me to my personal journey in a way you didn't actually so come into it until you were in your 30s. Yeah. No. Were you on a path of self-discovery before this when you were dealing with the anxiety and depression from that yeah. childhood trauma? Like throughout your teenage years and your early 20s, did you think to think about mindfulness and meditation? Or was it just kind of like it didn't happen until later in your life? Um, I think it was only, it wasn't even like any kind of, it was just trying to discover what, or th just to explore what, what makes me feel less stressed sure. <laughs> and more happy. So yeah. it was like, it was just like, then, you know, then one thing leads to the other. Oftentimes it's unfortunately like the most, you know, intense situations where we then like finally realize, oh, I got to do something, you know? And so after like a breakup, a girlfriend left, you know, a blue yoga mat in my apartment. <laughs> and, oh, wow. And then as a sign, um, you think? <laughs> no, I don't even know. I mean, she might have suggested it before and some friends might have suggested it before in my late 20s or so Okay. to to try it out. It wasn't so popular back then. And even in, in uh, when I was like, that was like maybe 31. Oh, wait, well, I was 29. Um, so it wasn't even so popular back then. I was living in Berlin. So, so I was just like, oh, I'll just give that a try. And then I felt the immediate benefits and that were kind of like just the feeling of like, oh my God, there's something about it made me realize to, to explore it more. And so, um, thank you so much, Michelle. <laughs> she <laughs> ever hears it. Thank you, Michelle. Similarly like that. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because we, we all have anxiety 
throughout our life and, and, and stress. And of course, nowadays with, with social media, with the world moving a lot faster, um, it's important to slow down. I think that when you're younger and if you don't have that information about meditation and mindfulness, you might seek other means. You might actually seek um, different drugs, um, different relationships, uh, kind of different, um, in, a, in a sense, something that is masking you from the reality of things. Mm -hmm. you're, uh, you're looking to get out of the present. You're looking mm -hmm. to escape the present moment. Mm -hmm. And meditation and mindfulness is something that brings us back into the present. So you, you find this interest. Um, you're also an artist. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you when did those kind of come into parallel or were they always in parallel? This creative artistry um, mm -hmm. side of you and then this side that uh, was interested in meditation and mindfulness and, and kind of maybe wanted to bring that to more people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I will even as an art on as an artist, first of all, I was back then in my 20s and I studied that as well. I was really interested in just what is reality? Why am I here? You know, what's going on? All and the then what's, questions. You know, what's <laughs> like, why, what is society doing and what, you know, what's the purpose here? And so, and I wasn't really satisfied with like the art world and how that is kind of, uh, how that might not be the most conducive to, to really be expo exploring creativity and being curious in that mm. way. And so then I also discovered, oh, there's, you know, like the field of contemplative practices when I got engaged in that. And then and then I found my way back also into like art and research and technology because I realized, oh, I can, you know, explore that in art because art is still uh, giving giving the opportunity to explore those things. Sure. And so kind of providing a niche in the society where it's not entirely like, you know, function driven or something, you know, you can still be exploring something that doesn't necessarily have like an end goal and mm. so you know so I, I still part of me I, is always developing some art projects you know especially tied up with this i can explore uh, explain that later yeah but um i think then also just i discovered you know oh my god you know just like uh technology is there and we can really do something with art and combining it with science uh, and then using this technological devices to bring more well-being to people and so i I'm, i still always consider everything like a you know equally artistic endeavor as well as you know whatever i do as considered an entrepreneur or you know technologist or something it's always like exploring what it means to be alive and how can we be happier or how can i be happier and maybe offer that to others it's kind of like as as much as you can find mindfulness and, and meditation and peace and in, in, in anything and mm -hmm. everything you can kind of find art and, and beauty and creativity everything as well yeah that's true um that's that's super yeah. fascinating and it's cool because i think that there's a lot of people that might develop throughout their careers and build a specific skill set mm -hmm. um related to maybe art maybe marketing or business um whatever it is and then they have these side interests mm -hmm. meditation and mindfulness and the decision to find a way to combine them um I think it is is a courageous one because usually what that means is that the more niche your focus, the less kind of employable you, you are in a um, sense. Um, do you agree with that? Um, maybe. I'm still not sure how employable I am. <laughs> you know, I was <laughs> like, a, but I think, I mean, what in the end, or not in the end, but, you know, just what makes me happy in a way, it's just like what what I want to do. Mm. And I think that I, even when I was considered an artist, I wasn't sometimes necessarily doing the artistic practice what that makes me the most happy because I was kind of adjusting it to like what is considered the art world and, you know, which can be like somewhat sure. like, you know, per, like business driven or something versus mm -hmm. like exploring like real, like true artistic endeavors. Like it might have been like, you know, um, a long time ago or so. Um, so I think... It's more like what, you know, what whatever I'm, what makes me happy. And I think if somebody, if, you know, right now I, I'm here at healme.nyc, I'm a part of the team, integrated wellness center and work with like offer meditation and different practices. But it also, it was a year, years long journey, you know, long, like almost 10 years now or so. And to get to this point where, you know, I can, you know, 
get like financial resources from this and stuff so but it, right but uh, so at first it was kind of like accepting like being sort of a niche maybe and now mindfulness and stuff is more like a mainstream or something so i feel like it's it's kind of but it, it it's some sacrifices there and some a way to get there but i always like to encourage everybody to motivate everybody to do what they love and i think if if that makes oneself happy i'm sure there's a lot of other people that will also benefit from what makes oneself happy and you know they would compensate they would you know provide you know money for that or you know whatever support to to learn from those things mm. so it's it's kind of like finding happiness in the pursuit of happiness um to a sense um so if you were talking to yourself maybe 10 years ago your your former self who who ha- hasn't gotten to that place where it's it makes sense where mm-hmm. you're still kind of like well i'm i'm doing what i like but maybe i'm not earning that income that i'm happy with or maybe i'm feeling some external pressure um because my friends are going to whatever they're doing getting married mm-hmm. whatever it is um how would you kind of tell yourself to to stay the course mm. I don't, just knowing myself from back then, I was like probably stubborn. <laughs> Something that somebody would, and I know that like you know my dear friend Hannah in Berlin, she always told me like you know why don't you try yoga or something, and I, I didn't do it. Sure. And it just came out of you know like the the intense suffering, and, you know, or like intense like you know the breakup, and then and then the personal like constant like anxiety where I, I tried something out. So I I don't even know how successful it would be to talk with me ten years ago. And that's that's why I also, but that's why I also believe it comes so much from feeling. You know, if if somebody takes a deep inhale and just letting go exhale, and then do that like ten, eleven times, they will probably feel more relaxed. You know, and that's mm. what I also, you know, when I take the subway and I was late, sorry again. <laughs> but then yeah. you know, I'm like in the subway and they're like, oh, you like, I can get anxious about it and MTA or whatever, but I can also just take deep inhales mm-hmm. and calm myself down. So that's why I feel it's more. It's it's literally like it had to be the feeling, and that's why I believe a lot into these days into providing like a feeling, like you know what immediately when I can feel it like as a whole experience. So and I know back then I was super mind driven, and you know it's like always like analyzing everything and okay. judging things. So yeah. so I just think if somebody would have approached me like telling me what to do, I don't know if I would have done it. Or so uh, it's interesting. I mean. I- I actually just got out of a, of a relationship and um, I've, it's the first time that I've gotten out of a serious relationship. So sorry, done a lot of research and reading about how to deal with it, how to deal with your emotions or whatever. And I think that you can spend a lot of time over analyzing, overthinking, mm-hmm. replaying things back, replaying stories back. Um, but that practice of breathing, of bringing yourself back to the presence, it's, it's so simple and it's kind of like mm-hmm. a simple solution to a much more complicated problem mm-hmm. in a sense. Was that, was that kind of what it was like for you when you had to deal with that breakup? Like it, it's weird because especially if you're, you're in a relationship, you find yourself kind of connected to that other person and then you're making decisions based on what there's kind of like a a collaborative process there Mm -hmm. and then you leave that and you're thinking to yourself is that really what i wanted am Mm -hmm. i maybe in a different path did you have any of those those thoughts is that kind of what led you into this path of of yoga um yeah and i i also think i mean relationships are always like a a tricky one but i feel like if we um if we like we store i feel like i store a lot of like you know, I've been storing a lot of like emotions and experiences in my body as like myself. So I feel just like a letting go exhale and yoga or like embodied practices are really allowing to release those pressure and like mm. almost like allowing it to fall into gravity. And it sounds so metaphorical or something, but I, I really believe that that's happening. If we consciously kind of like <sighs> let go and release things, then we can like release those tensions actually. And so, um, you know, I've been going through breakups since then as well. And, sure. you know, as, and I, I totally, I hear you, um, I hear you on your experience and, and, and I feel you, you know, and that's, it's always like a tricky one to deal with it. And I feel if I, I always try to, my friends embrace that. Um, my dear friends always like say like, listen to your heart and listen, you know, if I felt, you know, I was able to like fully open my heart and if, if my opening of my heart was embraced in that relationship mm. and, I feel like if my mind tries to dissect the relationship, what was happening, my partner, it's like, it's so tricky. And and in the end, end it comes down, you know, like 
we can never really know what the other person was like thinking and sure. or can we control our own thoughts or like guide our own thoughts so yeah. that's why i feel if my heart has been taken care of felt taken care of and i feel like i can totally open my heart to somebody then that's the most beautiful relationship i mean i find and i i'm also looking forward to experience <laughs> yeah <laughs> so. and and sometimes it's kind of like you just have to let it go and yeah and, that's um, true i mean it's it's the idea is that uh, there is really no no constant the only constant is change yeah. um so accepting it for for what it is it's it's trickier i and and i think that you might have some more direct experiences with people accepting their current place in life because you've taught mindfulness in in rikers island um, oh, that in a in, in prisons um and you're basically going into a situation where there's a number of people that probably aren't that happy with their current position in life mm -hmm. um what are some of those what what was that like because that has to oh. be that i'm really interested to hear about right, what that experience is like yeah i've been going in and out there since 2014 okay and volunteering um i haven't done it this year um it's just been it's always very tricky first to get in there um some tricky like, like to, um, to get access i mean okay. I, ha I have a volunteering card and you know i had i'm sure you know it's like usually you get it for a year i have to see if it expires so i still can use it you, then i was able to go in and out like f you know during the week and you just show it and then you go in but still if you're inside that high security jail it doesn't mean that you can easily get to the inmates and somebody has to get collect the inmates then oftentimes a security alarm so you know the times when i wa went every day like mm -hmm. every week mm -hmm. you know once once a week it was just like sometimes i just had to go back and then like a whole day of volunteering was kind of not really happening it was just like more learning of the system so if somebody's listening from the <laughs> new york city or somewhere <laughs> it's like please support the volunteers and it's not and it needs to have somebody inside one once i was able to be in there oftentimes i did it at the chapel or some somewhere um, you know, it, it can, it's very powerful because like it's an easy it's a yoga they already know about and that had certain like um, stigmas. Sure. You know, like you have like downward facing dog and all those things and the people, they walk around and then they make comments, some other, but then usually the ones who are engaged there, they, they know the transformative potential of those practices. So it is really important for anybody to offer that. And I think, and also just to experience that, what it is that there's really like a whole world out there of, of, you know, marginalized people uh, you know po part of the population uh, sure. um, and uh and it's mostly you know it, it's literally like an extension of like uh, kind of slavery i have to say so it's like there's almost two million people incarcerated and to to provide those access there they're really kind of locked up and oftentimes they're in rikers island they're they're not even found guilty so you know like and then you come in there and you they basically feel like they don't they don't they haven't done anything you know they right. share their story sometimes it was just like an hour of listening and then do a little bit of breathing exercises mm. once once i started the breathing it was a little bit more easier to go in there because we didn't have we didn't need the yoga mat so it was a little bit less preparation time okay um but yeah you know and like like on the outside it's kind of like people didn't oftentimes in there or like when i offered in the garden elizabeth street garden here weekly or so it's like oh my god like i have this potential to breathe deep and to you know calm myself down and th that's always stays the same in a way right it's just like as you said in a way like the people in there like it's oftentimes it's very kind of like unfair that they're there in the first place so especially when i walk i work with uh the adolescents in there i think they're like soon they won't be at rikers anymore you know it's like they're like 18 19 years old it's just kids. like crazy kids you know kids. like and they're in there in the same facility and you know yeah. they just they just share stories about like s knife stabbing and all those things you know and it's like just having an hour of like sharing and breathing together it's just like a safe space for them where they don't right. have to like encounter some threats and stuff um but it, it's really like uh, the most inhumane environment i've experienced and hopefully um you know politicians as well as population become more aware of that and they will change that and and anybody who can offer volunteering services in any capacity that's always um i think very much appreciated inside and but it sounds like there's easy. a lot of roadblocks to actually offering those volunteering there is but i think the well. more people um trying to offer that the, the more it will probably be made easier you know if it's like a few sure. people who want to get in then they just be like you have to get this paperwork you have to go to like another day of like getting this you know sit there somewhere and listen to um to listen to certain things to get a certain certificate like or no access and 
but anyway but it's it could have been made much easier and also maybe supported with like maybe some resources or something it was really hard but the more people who do it anybody who wants to like please reach out to me and i'm happy to you know share and to maybe um collaborate on getting in there together and stuff it's what are the um were you doing one-on-one or were you doing small groups no small groups small know, groups, small groups. So, so but then usually i was in there and then waiting in the chapel and they're trying to get the inmates and then sometimes you know they only got like a, f- a few of them yoga was it was easier because that was with a non-profit organization so sure. that, that we had like a fixed time and i think if it's an organization they take it sometimes more serious inside mm. there so they kind of like prepare everything when i was as an individual go in there then they they don't maybe have like the kind of like commitment in there to gather the inmates and stuff so oftimes had to wait half an hour an hour in a chapel in the prison in, in chapel, in in a prison. chapel. And, okay. then, and then they they found a few and so and then i made flyers and stuff but it's easier to go with an organization or with a collective or so because then they have like they they feel like there's more people if you go in as one person it's it's not it wasn't so easy but it's more difficult well yeah. um what type of breathing techniques were you teaching or mindfulness um, yeah mostly like the Wim Hof inspired techniques kind okay. of like so that's because that's more accessible there it's like if I if I start explaining Tibetan Salung or like <laughs> certain things <laughs> it gets more like uh, it has like a certain There's religious a aspect or something yeah. and then so I try to explain Wim Hof and you know he, he worked with Tony Robbins Oprah Winfrey with like martial arts people so and that sometimes resonates with some people in there you know when it's like also not like just like some a european guy working with some european people or something you know but it's more like he worked with like people from all kinds of backgrounds and stuff cool um let's talk about wim hof so uh for for context um wim hof known as the ice man um offers this specific type of breathing exercise which I think is backed in kind of a form of pranayama um, in addition to cold exposure. So you've been doing this for, for years. Do you still practice the Wim Hof uh, method on the, on the daily? Mm, I, I practice breathing momentarily. <laughs> <laughs> We're always so practicing I, breathing. I know, but like <laughs> conscious breathing, but it's more... Um, I don't know if, if it was like Vim's technique, but certain, I mean, certainly to a huge majority of Vim's technique, it's basically a deep inhale, letting go exhale, and then doing like, like 30, 40 times. Mm-hmm. But also like sometimes people push out the air, which I wouldn't recommend. But And then there's a breath holding phase. So I kind of do it when I do meetups or so, like a certain aspect of this. Sure. And I guide it, but I don't feel the differences. So I don't feel like the lightheadedness some people experience or like the because tingling. Because you've been doing it so long? Yeah, maybe, or or maybe I'm so so aware of my breathing that it's just like that that I I don't know I don't change my blood like or maybe my blood chemistry is changed that much already that it's like constantly has like a weird change <laughs> or weird in terms of because right. they did scientific studies on this technique, yeah. um, peer reviewed and um, published and written up in Nature and uh, PNAS which are the top science journals, and basically with twenty or thirty minutes of breathing this breathing technique people were able to resist the injection of e coli bacteria so that's really profound if like and so when i guide this you know after 20 or 30 minutes of breathing i know the people you know who do this or like the modified version or so they they probably have very intense experiences mm. but i do it with them and i don't experience it anymore which but i also haven't gotten sick since i started it which is about almost four or five years ago or something you haven't so, gotten sick since you started it no so i sometimes get a little bit of a headache I think once I had like a little bit of running nose in the winter or so, but yeah, so so I can highly recommend it. And um, it just takes, you know, like uh, the more you practice it, especially at a younger age, I do it with toddlers as well or like or kids in high school. Not so much with toddler, this technique, but I, I guide to um, mindfulness to toddlers. Mm-hmm. Um, the more people practice it and the more they combine it with like cold showers and cold immersions, the more people become aware of their breathing, I think also. And so... I think the more we're aware of our breathing, the more joyful our. I haven't seen a study on it, but that's how it is for me. Because then I can, <laughs> I can be somewhere and be like, "Oh my God, this happened!" And then, <sighs> whatever, you know. And so do you do cold like exposure as well? Yeah, I've done. I mean, I I take cold showers and okay. I, you know, every I, day. Uh, whenever whenever I I can. Whenever yeah. Can. So sometimes I give myself, you know, just 
uh, sometimes it's like, oh, like I'll take a cold shower, and then sometimes it's like, oh, but I'll do it because <laughs> I know it's good. And then sometimes I just take a warm shower. So, so, um, but mostly cold, yeah. And um, I also recommend, you know, cold, cold walks or something if the weather is chilly. Just but trying to always be trying to be aware of the breathing and just kind of like adjusting the breathing and relaxing the body sure. because it's kind of counterintuitive when we're in the cold actually then we're trying to tense up mm -hmm. but just thinking about how humanity spread all over the planet and with very little clothes probably for ten thousands of years it's like it's probably like being aware of our breathing and relaxing and kind of aligning ourselves to the cold forces was part of part of being and part of like exploring all kinds of cold climates or warm climates as well. So I always recommend like like cold showers, for instance, or but always trying, trying to relax the body and to keep focusing on calm breathing. So. Is your hypothesis for not getting sick in this many uh, in in so long just the fact that maybe you did it so much in the past um, that it kind kind of normalized for you? Because so so yeah. do you have like a, a daily practice right now? meditation or mindfulness practice breathing <laughs> it's like, it's no like, no it's it's, it, weird. <laughs> it's weird because because when i when i'm somewhat you know like right right now when we're talking like i'm aware of my breathing so so i don't when i i had a friend who's or i have a friend he's like we we gather at a space we do dinner and then we guide breathing exercise or meditation exercises and he was guiding a vipassana which i've done for years too sure. where you do like mm -hmm. 10 day silent retreats and you focus on your breathing but it's kind of observing it so you're not you're not supposed to alter it and i cannot do that anymore so when he did it and he was guiding this called anapana then yep. then afterwards he said i said like, i can't do this i can't observe my breathing i always i'm always guiding it and he said oh then maybe it's something with control or something but I, it's not like that for me it's not a control it's more like i'm guiding my breathing all the time so it's more it's but it's so joyful you know because i can instead of like thinking something that is you know, going through a breakup or whatever, or, you know, whatever it is, I can, I probably have some thoughts that are not really truthful or something. Sure. So if I'm, if I'm, if I'm calming myself down, it's probably like a good, better thing. So, uh, but it's also, as you said, as you asked before, it was probably, I did it so much that in the beginning phase, I might have gotten more sick. I felt more weak. So there was a time of adjustment the first weeks or months I practiced it. So I felt like super down. Practicing Wim Hof. Wim Hof, cold exposure, Tibetan yep. Salong, yep. and all kinds of things. So, I, so I think stuff comes up to come out in a way, and there's a phase of adjustment of the body where we we just learn how to handle this. And I trusted. I was, a, I always say like trusting the practices which have been around for so many more years and or have also been scientifically studied. Trusting those practices was really important, and not trusting right. my maybe confused mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, yeah. I mean it's it's the it the the analogy. It's kind of what you said. Um, stuff comes up to come out. The way that I think about that is even after a traumatic experience, you're going to have all these emotions and feelings, no matter what it is, and stuff is coming up. And um, the reaction is to kind of reject that. Mm -hmm. um, if you have if you have a negative emotion, the the reaction is let's go on Netflix, let's do something else, let's go on our phone. Um, but if we can kind of accept the coming up, then it kind of comes out a little mm -hmm. bit quicker. Mm -hmm. um, and then to, to kind of transition, I think it's a, it's a good transition. You, you talked a little bit about, it's very interesting because, so the Wim Hof cold exposure, it kind of comes from this um, evolutionary biological need for us to be more like human beings in a sense mm -hmm. um meaning that we kind of came our ancestors were were more well equipped to the the world they didn't have uh ac and heat like like they do today um but i also believe that well not that i believe um our ancestors didn't have access to technology didn't have access to um computers and screens that they were looking at for mm -hmm. 8 to 10 to 12 to 14 hours a day especially now where we're working in in office jobs um you're staring at your screen all day so there to transition kind of to talk a little bit about breathing.ai um it seems like there's there's some parallels there Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> and really, everything led to that. Today. <laughs> and uh, I just want to. Uh, what you said is also just being okay with it. I think an advice. I don't know if I would have 
done it 10 years ago when I was feeling depressed and anxious, you know, mm. somebody would have come to me and say like, you know, just maybe try to be okay with it. You know, I think that's also like a first step of like, you know, being like healing or, you know, like feeling happier, just being okay with what happens. And I think oftentimes when we go on technology or something, we're trying to distract from what is going on. Sure. And so I don't even necessarily see technology or whatever we develop as something separate. It's more like I see it as an acceleration as a, of human intelligence. So if we accelerate, if, you know, amplify it, like the distraction element and not being okay with the pain with a feeling or discomfort and trying to transform it from within then we're like seeking something else so like whatever we we've developed as like apps and whatever is like very highly designed in a very sophisticated way to get our attra- attention and but then also in the not only get the attention but oftentimes it's tied up to like the heart symbols and the likes and stuff actually to kind of like induce a good feeling because then we we see that in like a certain you know kind of you know dopamine or happy hormone or whatever it's uh, you know it might be uh, depending on like what was looked at um and scientifically but you know is is induced and so it, it really like has also this embodied component in that we look at this to distract ourselves but then it also ev- invokes like a, a joy within us but we don't it comes from the outside and we're not able to necessarily generate it from within and i right. think that's where where my interest c- comes in of like, cause we did a lot of VR biofeedback projects and AR projects, um, award won, we won an award at Stanford and presented at museums and so, and I worked at the Institute of Neuroscience at the University of Oregon for two years. So, so a lot of those, like the, what I'm engaged in now is like both my personal experience, but also a lot of like science and, and artistic development and research. So, um, so we're really like looking at like, oh, how can we actually, use what is out there in terms of um the screens you know the the ability of screens and machine learning and programming to induce a happy happier state or like you know attention but then also how can we how can we integrate the body and breathing patterns in there and i think we're right now literally at a cutting edge where we can use the webcam and uh, the mobile camera and machine learning to detect it so it's really just now these years where we can do that and then we also have a patent-based software to adapt it. So it's really like a very interesting time these days because we can like f- integrate the body more into technology with like very like with what we have as technology already instead of like, you know, the last years we've been working a lot with wearables or people had to put on like a heart rate sensor or, right. or you know, we also did EEG studies and all those things. But I think that's always you know who will put on and even like who will put on a vr right like i mean like who's li- who's whoever's listening who has a vr device and uses that and and i, I felt that after f- a while i didn't feel comfortable of like you know i want to put i want to offer like a vr biofeedback and then put another screen on, in front of people's face you right. know? <laughs> so i was like so getting away from that and actually using what we have as screen time as you said almost maybe 14 hours a day sometimes crazy or so and making that screen time really like personalized and so maybe we want to spend less time on the screen because we did what we needed to do on the screen mm. in terms of like business and interactions and then we enjoy actually more personal presence because we feel more connected to you know our like heart and you know our just our nervous system and we know how to make ourselves happy and i truly believe like social interactions and and you know and touch communication is really like makes us essentially more joyful maybe we have de-learned how to like engage in a sure. meaningful way with each other so, so um did you have any formal training in in kind of looking at vr ai um did you do any kind of school work with neuroscience like how did you mm-hmm. i mean how did you just get in get involved with this um uh i think uh the the blessings of a few <laughs> renowned scholars to work to accept my self-teaching so i I, um, after like a comprehensive uh, art project I on an ecological catastrophe, it was called Eclipses on my website, and uh, I didn't feel comfortable with just leaving it like this. So I advised a graduate program for the University of Michigan. I did a lot of yoga and mindfulness, and I feel like my mind became so much more clear. And like, I was like, oh my God, I can, you know, read all those things and I can understand all those, you know, at least to a certain degree. So right. like, I became so much better you know at least like uh, comprehending things and then i got accepted with a comp- also very comp- 
ambitious proposal to the University of Oregon. They had a, um, a residency there, an artist residency and visiting scholar at um, from 2014. So I, I applied with um, the proposal for multiple um, studies in using neuroscience and I think it was good enough for them to accept it. And then I was also a visiting scholar in uh, um, quantum and nanoscale physics lab. So I was there in the, the meetings for two years. and Self-taught. Uh, yeah, well, quantum physics, I have really have like very few, and and that's. But I mean, I ha I learned so much in that lab that I know there's so much talk about quantum physics that it's not quantum physics. Right. So um, thanks again to um, Benjamin Alleman and his lab. They're very supportive and very kind with me, trying to understand this complex um, complex processes there, and and uh, and then neuroscience was a little bit. Uh, easier for me to understand because like the it's like so, you know you use MATLAB you leave, use different kinds of methods and stuff and there's also like I feel like in neuroscience there's a higher level of interpretation within the data which is a, can also be a bit tricky but we were able to we had oh, for instance like one funny thing we had a we were able to we wanted to do some studies on visual stimuli which we did at the lab of Ed Vogel and then the, the researcher Irida Mans I was working with um and she was she she didn't believe so i think sorry i read if that's wrong and she ever listed <laughs> um, she was like she was a little skeptical of meditation and if it were able to change her brain frequency so she okay. she asked me to come in on a, on a sunday and prepare the study and she knew i was meditating and so so she put me into this like randomized study setting and then we had really interesting results and we we tested so many more subjects and then and then those kind of like studies on the side from the during the week we had all the studies on visual stimuli on the weekend we we're kind of like testing meditation studies on our own which actually a lot of researchers do to do studies on themselves and okay. on their colleagues just to see how it works and then without irb approval you need some approval from some board and stuff so we did that and then that was like end of 2014 2015 really interesting results because you literally can see like different meditations had like different brain frequencies okay and then I approached Michael Posner, who's a very renowned scholar, um, um, National Medal of Science winner, and he he found those uh, preliminary results interesting enough to do the meditation studies. Yeah, the meditation studies to do an MRI study with with us on um, also doing a similar setting, but then using MRI where you see the blood flow through the brain, basically, where you have to go in this machine, this tunnel, and they have a very sophisticated. Um, uh, MRI machine at the University of Oregon. Yeah. So I did that, and then f and like a funny story is also I went to the a conference in Helsinki at the University of Helsinki. So I was in Europe presenting the results there, the preliminary results, mm -hmm. and then at the dinner table they just it was like random seating, and then I ended up next to a scholar at Princeton you know, from Princeton University, Ray sure. Lee, and he was doing a very similar study as we did at the University of Oregon, and he was at Princeton, so on the East Coast we were on the West Coast, but then we met in Europe. <laughs> and then and then that led to me going to Princeton multiple times doing like uh collaborating with him on studies i i um he also presented at the stanford panel i we won an award and so it was a very interesting time for research but it also made me realize w w i mean first of all like i think motivating anybody to self teach themselves and approach universities and to maybe even just collaborate to work together i think researchers these days might be more open also to do that and not to close their gates especially with how the limited funding science gets and there's so much beautiful science out there that is not communicated and there's so much especially developers who could work or artists who can work with scientists and then to always like motivate anybody to just write researchers and research universities and see like if there's to reach out to reach out and to yeah. connect with them and then also for um for myself it was just very interesting to see that there's also a limitation with research so that's why i mean like reaching out with people who, who are not in research but also researchers reaching out because i think it can be very slow and so combining the research with like in this case you know art and now like the business we're doing it reaches more people and and essentially what research is doing is also we want to communicate that and have that integrated and especially studies on meditation are sometimes forgotten because they don't have a lobby as the pharmaceutical lobby and stuff. So they don't have the backing, the, the backing of the, the money. Yes, the money. So, um, so it's really important to get this out, and and that's what. So that's why I'm also running Breathing AI now um, to really like fast track it. You know, as a startup and young a small business, we gotta 
we got multiple uh, collaborations with Cooney and, and others going on. So it you know, fast tracks it and you know, with more investments and we can also do our own studies and we have a computational neuroscientist also on our team. And so, uh, yeah, so we, we can, you know, do like good studies, but then we can team up. We also, um, team up with university of Texas the last month and then with other research universities. So I think, um, that's a good com uh, combination, especially since our companies focus on well being. And you know, and obviously we need more resources mm -hmm. to to offer this, and uh, and it's a win win for everybody. But and, and it's not like oh we're doing this, but you know, behind the user we're like literally just interested in profiting of them or something. You know, we're really interested in well being, and I think w we're also pioneering that as a company to a research based, research inspired um, approach focusing on well being. What were and, um what were the different types of meditation that were tested in that uh, initial study that that you did? We did um, a Vipassana, so like a, a body scan, and mm -hmm. then we did uh, breathing focus back then. It was not a changing focus. Then it was mantra. It's like a transcendental meditation. Mantra, yeah. We just like, a, um, yeah, a t, like TM is also TM. part of that. So yeah. like you repeat a mantra, and then, and then oftentimes baseline. So just like you have like a baseline and then scanning different body parts where we had, where you, we internally had some discussions. It's like, you were scanning the brain and the body. You're only supposed to scan one. It's like there's so <laughs> many different parts. If you talk about body scan, then because if you we did it in MRI and we, if you like scanning the body, basically means you're like you bring awareness to different body regions. Mm -hmm. Then also there's a relaxation meditation technique. So we also did that where you should like relax the body, but then body scan or vipassana as you like focus on the regions without sure. doing anything. But what, yeah, what so were the result? What was the most? Um, I don't want to say the best, but what seemed to ha make the biggest difference out of those kind of different modalities? Um, I, I, I wish we would have back then had like um, a changing breathing patterns because the awareness of breathing didn't show so much. But I think um, like seeing at Wim Hof's technique, like changing the breathing patterns has a huge impact. Body mm. scan was, I think, when in our case was the most effective. Um, like when we looked at EEG, like for instance, we looked at the uh, theta frequencies. So like, you know, all kinds of frequencies are always present in the brain, but then you can see if there's a correlation between like doing this practice and then there's an increase in theta waves or alpha waves or something, you know. So um, if we close our eyes, you know, like alpha waves are already different because alpha waves are very connected to visual cortex, for instance. So that's a good example of like somebody closes their eyes. Um, there's like a difference of alpha frequency. So, but always everything is present. So oftentimes it gets simplified, but, but the most interesting was definitely body scan. So that brings it also back to like, you know, a full body has a very like awareness of the full body has a very sure. like big impact on how our brain frequencies are and how we perceive ourselves in the world. It's interesting because I've done um, a, a 10 day and a three day Vipassana oh, retreat, cool. nice. oh. um, which was very challenging, but also very rewarding at the same time. Yeah. Um, and after that, I started practicing Vedic meditation or transcendental mantra based mm -hmm. meditation. Um, and have done that pretty consistently and have realized um, much more like lasting changes doing that. But what I also realized was when I started to do the mantra based meditation on a, on a uh, daily basis, transcendental meditation on a daily basis, twice a day, I realized that I was finding myself more mindful of my breath throughout the day. Mm. So I think that whether if I was just focusing on my breath for 20 minutes twice a day versus the mantra, I'm not sure if the results would have been the same, um, but it's kind of like you're flexing a muscle in a sense. Mm -hmm. And if you're flexing it intentionally in a specific sit, then you can kind of bring that. So you bring more awareness randomly when we're talking right now. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of the way that you think about it in a sense? Because, um, you know, you have, you have kind of a, a, a peaceful demeanor about yourself. And from what you've said, you don't really have a formalized practice right now you just kind of breathe <laughs> um has that came from this compound effect of so many hours of intentional practice do you think yeah for sure and also okay. just to say i mean i i still do guide yoga mindfulness and breathing and do it at the same time with the people so and you know so that could be just like hours a week too mm. so just aside from the conscious breathing i i you know throughout the day that's always that's still something i do so, and I think I know from other yoga practitioners, they also do 
do you know they're like oh i'm doing so less, less yoga but then they don't because they just guide so many classes so but um yeah i think like and i i also when you say like flex the muscle it's like we have the inhale muscles you know like the diaphragmatic breathing right in like and it's i see it as an altar so you basically have like the diaphragm um diaphragm and then the rest the heart and lungs rest on it and we we if we breathe shallow through our chest we basically are constantly in in fight or flight mode in panic mode sort of a little bit more so if we calm down if we breathe through the belly and using the diaphragm you know first of all like it's an intention it's a conscious attention so if you do mantra you also use a very specific focus and intention something it has the body scan component in there in a way like vipassana so yep. so you you focus on your body you focus on a specific body part we're one of the few species that become aware of the breathing and internal organs you know so those are two unique benefits if we don't use them we like you know then like what a dolphin is like smarter in that right. sense <laughs> like, i mean they might be smarter anyway but <laughs> but uh so and then using the belly breathing we so you have this attention you have like expansion but you also know like by the, the lungs are also just like almost like tr upside down tree in our chest so like the lung wings you know i think they're called lung wings for a reason not only have this they just tree like branches mm -hmm. but they also can make us feel like flying you know so i think almost like v thinking of the lung wings literally of the having the ability to make us feel like flying by but also by belly breathing you know so really breathing into a belly and then so you have the attention you have like the the body scan but you also have the expansion you know, you have like the attention there, you expand the belly and thereby you nourish yourself with more more energy and you literally change your blood flow. You know, you t that's also like the Vim studies on Vim's technique and others. Right. So, so I think you have a lot of unique benefits and one of the main problems these days is like cardiovascular diseases, anxiety and stuff. And those are very much related to like poor blood circulation and shallow breathing you know so i think it's very tied into like improving the the breathing patterns we really like result into like feeling less anxious you know feeling more happy and and it but it also it, like includes all the different like a lot of different um meditation um modalities in a way methods so it's interesting because uh, you're a lot of it you're we're talking about internal work here and then your work with breathing.ai um it's kind of you're you're talking about an external an external screen, right? Oh yeah. Um, you leveraging the the webcam to actually be able to see how uh, the different colors in a screen is affecting some some mm -hmm. um, somebody. Um, and you talk about like the the personalization of sc screens with AI and bio data. Mm -hmm. um, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> hey, that's a good. <laughs> so <clears throat> so it is. Let's say let's say bio data, even though it's called like physiological computing. Mm -hmm. Or let's say biometrics, that's also like, it's like um, the wrong term, but let's just stay with it now so it's easier. And biometrics, so biometrics in this case then would be a breathing and heart rate. So, and these days we can detect breathing and heart rate. They're very kind of tied in. Um, the, you know, the, like, the faster you breathe, the more your heart rate is. We can detect this now with external devices like the webcam and machine learning. Okay. So that's what we're doing. So we're like personalizing screen experiences. First of all, we need to detect the biometrics. So we, we need to give access. The user needs to give access to their webcam or mobile camera. And then we can use that analysis of like, oh, what's the heart rate? What's the breathing pattern? And then our patent-based software uh, with breathing AI, breathing.ai is basically to learn like what kind of subtle changes of colors of font style can really like improve that person's breathing pattern and right now we're we um, we offer like analysis of colors and font styles and some on our website there's a, a link to a video with just self reports so it's like shows like that um the heart rate can change like 10 20 beats per minute with like a different font style or a color, you know? So like if you if you imagine like the amount of hours we spend on a screen right now, it's not personalized. It's yeah. not personalized at all. There's no integration of our body in this. It's only like our mind in a way, like what we click, what we like swipe at. But it's not like looking at like, oh, how does this affect our heart rate and breathing pattern? So mm. we are really, personalization means really like personalizing it, calming the user based on their bio data and biometrics. and using that on the back end it's called like the the programming on the back end uh, is it are, are they how is it personalized to an individual would when i maybe see be shown different a color or font yeah. than somebody else and if so why would i be shown that different color 
So, for instance, um, it could slightly, when you open it up, it show, you know, like there's this waiting reel. And then so it shows you like different colors and font styles really fast and then learns and in like a scientific study, randomized. So we don't, you, you know, so just because we learn so much fast, like, oh, what's a, what's in a sequence? Mm -hmm. And then we would just analyze like, oh, what kind of color actually have what kind of like, you know, uh, physiological react bio reaction from you. And then we would then uh, on our program learns like what is the most calming for you, you know. And for instance, you can just imagine like if, you, if somebody has an iPhone and they have like only like blue and green chat bu chat bubbles. Yeah. But you know, with with our approach, it's like so personalized. So some people really like green. Some people are more like or like calm and green, and some people is calming at blue. So you can't really estimate like blue is always calming. It's not, you know, for some people, blue might actually like get their heart rate all the way up. So just imagine if somebody has an iPhone and they they don't like the color green or they're, they're not even they don't like it. Maybe they like it, but their nervous system gets accelerated. So if they get a message from somebody with an Android, you know, they always like in fight or flight in, stre in stress mode. So um, so they, that's why I think personalization. And these days we grew up, we're not all, not all under an open sky. So we don't always affiliate like, oh, blue is sky is... Right. is calming so i think that's why a personalization makes sense because we all grew up with different colors um evoking a different reaction within us so so you've actually seen um different different people react to different colors yeah, totally. it's, there's very not different, like very different no yeah there's not a lot there's it's kind of random yeah. in a sense that's interesting right. because sometimes people would assume that there's specific colors that are more calming, but I guess that's yeah. not the case. And do you, do you, what's the hypothesis on why that person is appreciative of that color? Have you gotten oh. there yet? No, it isn't. That, that, that's a, that's more like a deep learning. Like if there's really like a correlation between like a certain, and I mean, I, I worked a little bit or I am connected to the, um, to the lab of like Richard Taylor, they do like uh, analysis of like, uh, they did studies on uh, fractal patterns. Okay. And like also with like level, I think they did studies on maybe education, how educated, it's like really like tricky to do any kind of correlations on like what kind of population. I mean, I think it's probably more like what kind of like demographics or so, like maybe has a preference to a certain color, but I think overall saying there's like, this kind of thing works for mankind. Mm. It's even like sometimes bright colors were like not calming or so. Like it were calming for some people and then some people then didn't like them at all. Yeah, so it's really... Right. What uh, What are your plans with, with breathing.ai? We well, first we're developing like a web app so everybody can access it and just learn about the most calming color and font styles and just try it out and then and then you'll actually can, they'll be able to take that and then take change the, their phone that account. one is the next app so okay. we we develop a, a plugin so like similar to grammarly that you install it and then mm. we can also have a personalized kind of analysis based on our patent based software that it can like say like oh you know like if you're like after lunch maybe you want to like to a healthy degree get your heart rate a little bit higher right because you feel tired so it like shifts the colors a little bit more to like you know a, like a uplifting like heart rate increasing um colors and and font size, but always that it's pleasurable for the user because some people really don't like uh, like for instance like um comic sun some people hate or like so um but yeah we so plugin is next one after that color app and then also we would love to work with a smartphone company or like uh, you know change like an operating system making that more personalized offering like first personalized phone mm. so you can really like the whole phone experience will always pers like a chat app you know will be personalized to you so we're also seeking partnerships or partnerships with designers online design companies or really where we can like integrate our software as a as a you know very unique future in that sense and so first the web app then the plugin and so yeah and it's a lot and then obviously the 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 main goal is really like to to integrate deep learning that's like not the end goal but sort of like um the, we need huge data sets for deep learning and deep breathing is also something most people probably don't practice right so if we like train deep learning set to like actually to guide each user to a deep learning they deep breathing they've never had before mm -hmm. so like subtle changes will constantly guide the user to like deeper and deeper breathing so and, and that's i think but then we need like really huge data sets so like that the, that the program itself that the back end knows like how to guide the user there and so and but i think that's a very beautiful beautiful thing really tying that in really like deep learning and and i think that's where ai for me really comes in okay. to learn about ourselves 
and to learn about each user and to and just mankind and to, to bring us more you know happiness and well-being and not to like use whatever we are into like profit like for a few companies but really like build companies and build approaches that are really like using ai for the for the benefit of right. mankind and the planet yeah we a lot of times think about how we're becoming so obsessed with technology in a, a negative perspective, how we're becoming addicted to these platforms. And it seems that what you're trying to solve for is the reality of the situation mm -hmm. is that we are going to continue to use these more and more. We're yeah. not going to escape them. So how can we have a more healthy relationship with them? And mm -hmm. how can we actually leverage them to help ourselves be better human beings? Yeah. In a sense while you're also kind of teaching mindfulness and meditation on, on the side, it's like a side hustle type of yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, unfortunately you have put it very well. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah. And I think the, the reality of like running this business is that I have to spend a lot of screen time and just to communicate with everybody. Oftentimes it's, you know, our team is like remotely in different continents right now as well. So, um, although we're New York city based, but, um, it, you know, it's like so much screen time communicating with everybody. So I love guiding it to toddlers and to, you know, I think right now, like my age range is from two to 82 or three to 82 or something. Right. So I love Who that. you're teaching mindfulness. Mindfulness too. and breathing. So I love doing that. And I, hopefully I can continue this even though, our, you know, company gets busier and busier because it always gives me like a few hours of screen free time. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, <you know? laughs> and so I can, uh, yes, there's no way I'm going to be on the screen while I guide. But, but you attribute a lot of your ability to um, focus on these more complex problems to your practice of mindfulness and meditation. Oh, yeah, 100%. Would you have any recommendations for people that are interested in becoming kind of a meditation or a mindfulness teacher? Um, oh. Speaking as somebody who might be interested. Practice. 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 Like There's like nothing... No, no certificate can can uh, replace like the practice of guiding, guiding sessions. Mm. Just getting out there, practicing family, friends, whoever is there, and just to get feedback, and to learn how to how to guide, you know, in a more aligned way, in a more like uh, way that is well perceived, but is that still powerful? And I don't know. I keep learning. Like every time, it's like a, you know, a new new session is like oh my god, especially with toddlers. Like I'm, I'm initially the most nervous when I guide toddlers because toddlers. you have, because you know if you guide like one hour of, of mindfulness to toddlers compared to our lifetime, you know, when somebody's in their thirties, forties, like like one hour is not that much for a toddler. It's huge. Their yeah. brain is still growing. Right. So right. I'm the most nervous there. Like I can speak with investors or whatever. That's like oh you know you give us a million or not, but if like the toddlers like they don't they don't like this and then they will not do this for another ten years or something, but um. <laughs> uh, well the toddlers are probably not that like you know judgmental about yeah, it but <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> but uh no but i think like practice you know like practicing it like with different age groups and seeing you know where also one's own practice resonates the most you know some some people might be better of like working with like you know in a corporate environment mm. I, i'm doing that too but you know that's also a different setting and adapting to those settings so. um I'm going to butcher this quote, but uh, it's something along the lines of um, society progresses in a in a positive way when individuals um, when individuals plant trees that they will not get to see grow. Oh, um, and I think that that's a beautiful sentiment for kind of teaching teaching children mindfulness again because that one hour or a couple hours that you spend with them can have such a large impact yeah. in, in the yeah. in the span of their lifetimes. Um, and I'm, and I'm going to just assume that, um, that's some of the most fulfilling work that you do. Yeah. Yeah. And the most, the most, uh, Ner I'm the most nervous there. Or like, are you, are you the nervous because you're intimidating or you're, I mean, I guess it sounds like you're nervous because you want to make sure that they like get it. They get it. It's just like, you know, it just, it's a different, they're just like, they're just joyful and happy. And also like I, I work with autistic kids and they're like, or I mean they're labeled autistic. I don't like those labels right. or like low function in one school or like disabled. And, but you know, just finding also the right techniques for them because I'm so used to adults and it's like a very like mind approach where it's easier, but they're like, they're so joyful. And so, you know, they want to like explore. And so like finding the techniques, getting out of like, or, you know, working with adults was like this. And then you yeah. go in there and be like, hey, guys, like this. Like, <laughs> you know, and then like, what do you guys want to do? Let's do dragon pose. And like, oh, what's dragon pose? But then let's invent a dragon pose. 
and then connect, connect breathing with the dragon pose. Did you create this your own program to teach <coughs> these children, basically? Uh, I, I've been working with Mission B with Karen Winter also in middle schools and high school, beautiful nonprofit, and uh, working with Yvette Brown, and they all have like the different approaches, but then I think because I have so many years of experience, I bring in my own too, so it depends on if I work on my own, I bring my own, and then if I work for a company, I can adjust it and integrate my own into their curriculum or so so okay it depends, yeah. so it really just kind of depends yeah I mean, yeah that that's yeah. that's great i mean um and do you do are you able to kind of earn an income that way or is that all like yeah non-profit? okay yeah yeah no. okay i mean cool. i mean um yeah i know it depends you know like if it's like schools unfortunately it's like could be better paid and it could be way more jobs and i think for sure but so everybody who who's interested in this like just reaching out like practicing practicing connecting with those companies searching those few companies who offer this or like going to schools directly and and the more i think it's offered the more people also realize like oh let's try it out and they usually see the benefits Mm -hmm. within their kids you know so so the more people are doing it and then it's also probably well more better paid i usually get you know like i I charge of course more for corporations and stuff and unfortunately in schools they have low resources limited resources but i still like to do it even though it's not what i you know it's hard to sustain yourself only in schools basically doing this but But the corporations are you doing more um like wim hof style yeah i was at Cooney last week I do usually have like a regular WeWork headquarter and other offices there it's more like for like sitting down on a chair desk so so really dealing with like inhale exhale retention which is a lot from half and um, not doing so much movement or so so when I go to schools so we oftentimes they can get up we can walk around do some mindfulness walking or so and I like to guide it in offices especially like v- Vim's inspired like Wim Hof inspired techniques or something but doing something that is that they can practice at their desk too. So if somebody's listening, you know, just opening up the palms and closing the palms is a very simple one. Just having the palms open and focusing on breathing <sighs> immediately gets the breathing usually deeper. So trying to get the breathing more into the belly. Usually with open palms, it's easier. And then closing the palms or like making the arms like crossed uh, on the chest. Usually it's like harder because it was <sighs> to breathe in deeper. We mostly breathe through our chest. So those are very simple techniques where somebody, if they're at their desk, just like under the table or like on the desk, just opening up the palms or having that as a reminder to breathe deep. So I I like to give little tips in offices, especially where they can just practice that. And and little tips like this are really effectful for uh, impactful for the day. And then uh, so, yeah. Do you think that there is going to be um, more of a growing demand in the in the need for meditation teachers mindfulness teachers yeah and i i'm still my father was a lifelong teacher is retired now but i think the the whole like educational system will change and probably also like the niche thing maybe maybe in technology or something you have to like be niche but then also these days a lot of developer you know full stack developers so many different languages you need to kind of know and i think the more like the demand goes up also the more you have to adapt and self-learn and self-teach yourself and you know so i think it's almost like essential in the future to like learn how to self-regulate and how to calm yourself down so i think my hope is that in the future that like that's an essential part of like the school curriculum where you have like a few hours of mindfulness classes or like how to learn how to self-regulate right because the studies are there it's you know like these days more and more so and there like, doesn't have to be a religion tied to it either or spirituality no not at all it's gonna be very practical no just the religion if like if this body we have, you know, that, that we can change it. And that's sometimes a religion because sometimes people say like, oh, we are the way we are. But then <laughs> you take medication or something to change it. But like yeah, that no. we have the, the belief that we have the power, the ability to to make ourselves happier and to create, you know, joy for, for ourselves with this beautiful, um, you know, body we have and experience. It's, that's a, sort of like a belief sometimes sometimes not so the, yeah so. i mean you can have i think i i don't remember the name of the book but you can have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset you can have a fixed mindset mm-hmm. of this is what it is and there's really no way to change and mm-hmm. i'm just in this position or you can have a growth mindset um and it's and the growth mindset is the realistic mindset because mm-hmm. we are we are constantly changing um so if you have a fixed mindset saying that you're not going to change it's actually a conundrum. It's mm-hmm. not right. It's not correct. Um, cool. Closing up here. Uh, 
I kind of want, I, I would love if you would be able to share, because you've taught so many people mindfulness and meditation, um, if you could share maybe a couple experience that you had of, of people really seeing the, the benefits from it. Mm. Just here, the last class at healme.nyc, mm -hmm. like uh, um, just this, somebody had like an uh, out of body experience. So just lying there and doing the breathing he said like oh i felt i was like floating above myself or so and then other people like the one guy i did a private i do private sessions too with people at their apartments or something they, they gathered a group the one guy had his hands cramped and i was going up there like you okay and he said like yes i am and then afterwards he's like he never felt this way the one of the most beautiful is also um she's a dear friend now she's 82 years and over christmas she left a voice message And she said, like, she never felt as good as during the breathing sessions. I was guiding at Elizabeth Street Garden. Okay. You know, I almost, like, feel, like, sentimental now, like, hearing this. And, you know, just having somebody who's over 80, like, experiencing this joy, you know. And and I'm not really teaching. I'm just guiding this, you know. I feel like I'm learning equally with anybody who's there. And, you know, the toddlers, the kids, when they, you know, say to their parents, like, One of my friends w happened to be one of the parents. I was, uh, you know, when I was t guiding his kid in school and the kid was coming home and, and talking about like the mindfulness experience. And then at some point he made a connection. Wait, like there was like a Wim Hof breathing and stuff. I might know that guy. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then he's also, he's a faculty at a, at a research university here. And he said like, are you that guy <laughs> <laughs> who's teaching, like, who's guiding my, my kid? And that's always, that's always beautiful. And, I mean, seeing all kinds of ages responding to this, it's just like, you know, reaffirms like it's the practices, you know, guiding the practices, getting more experience with them and trusting those practices. And and uh, I'm really grateful to, to have learned about this. Yeah, it's 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 beautiful that you have and that you're able to share it with so many people. Um, just a couple more questions. Uh, this comes from the Tim Ferriss podcast. Um, when was the last time you cried tears of joy? Tears of joy. Oh, almost just now. I had to hold them back because <laughs> I was think thinking about, about the the eighty two year old <clears throat> yeah. lady, and she said that this was some one of the most happiest like moments that she's yeah. had. Yeah, it's it's amazing that somebody can find this, find happiness eighty two years into their life, or mm -hmm. that type of thing. It's that's beautiful. Um, If you could go on a road trip with anybody, alive or dead, who would you go with and where would you go? Alive or dead? Yeah. Um, I think uh, I would maybe Ama. I love Ama. Like, Ama. The, like the, the, the woman who hugs people. Yep. I think it's like a very joyful. Um, um, probably just more on a road trip uh, somewhere along the water, along the coast. And Hilma Afklim, the artist who's on display now, I think I learned about her 10 years ago or something. And and I think that was a very interesting that she was able to do all these artworks. And now they're finally here in New York. But 10 years ago, we were just like, hey, well, who's that? But she was like the first abstract, pa Western ab abstract painter. Right. And I think there's a lot of like interesting symbolism, colors in there. I would love to learn more about this. So having a chat with her, like, oh, what was that? Like, where was that coming from? Did she have certain practices? And like the the persistence of her doing those painting those paintings even though she wasn't as recognized as like the male painters back then artists in those times i think that's that's really interesting and you know like um just what she was going through how she was able to keep those um you know beautiful like super creative um inspiring artworks which are now you know 21st century like you stand there and you're like what right so uh yeah so there's a few and i always like i always love the water and And going along like the Pacific, especially, I love that. Or now, maybe if we can all gather and go on some of those um, small islands, which unfortunately might vanish soon with sea level rise, and and chat with the people there and learn from them. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs>